That was a career starter and a life ender. I was working as a waiter. There's got to be more to it than this. I think you were named as one of the, the most influential photographers, street photographers of today. Never give up, man. How you judge your own photography. I think photographers by nature are just ultra competitive. You can't be the master of everything. The photography is the person. Do you feel like being so critical of ourselves is is almost negative in a way and we can never kind of be in the moment and be happy with kind of what's what we've done as you get older you start seeing life in different ways i've done this what's next how much higher can it get is there one moment or image that really kind of changed the way you fundamentally view yourself or life in general through through the lens of photography I describe it as the, the day that my life ended and a new life began. Welcome to another episode of The Mood Podcast, where we jump into the minds of the most creative and inspiring photographers, artists, and storytellers. I'm your host, Matt Jacob, and today we have yet another wonderful guest joining us on the show. Phil Penman is a renowned British-born New York-based photographer who has been documenting the ever-changing streets of New York City for over 25 years. His work has featured in prominent publications such as The Guardian, The Independent, and The New York Review of Books. Phil is especially known for his powerful reportage following 9-11, arguably a seminal period for his photography career. And his photography has been exhibited in Leica galleries and international exhibitions in cities like Venice, Berlin, and Sydney. He's also a sought-after photography educator, teaching workshops around the globe for Leica Academy. In today's episode, then, we touch upon Phil's philosophy on photography and life. We kick off with a moment or image that fundamentally changed his view on life. And we explore the role of serendipity in his art and discuss the significant events he's covered, including notably the pandemic lockdown and how these experiences have really shaped his perspective. Phil shares his thoughts on the current state of photography, the impact of technology and what aspiring photographers should focus on to stay true to their vision. We also touch upon his process of curating exhibitions his experiences at photography festivals and the rewarding moments of teaching photography to his students in his workshops. In addition, we discuss Phil's approach to blending narrative and visual poetry in his work. And we discuss the relationship between photography and time and how he injects his personal philosophy into his images. Phil also provides valuable insights into his writing process, the challenges and rewards of the industry, and his views on the future of street photography. A shame I couldn't quite be there in person with Phil, but we battled on with conversing through the computer, and I hope it still did the experience justice. So now I bring you Phil Penman. Mr. Phil Penman, welcome to the Moo Podcast. Thanks for joining us all the way from New York. Thank you very much for having me, sir. Appreciate it. I wanted to start by, as I kind of do, opening with a more of a philosophical um, a gambit, should I say. And you've had an extensive experience and career in the street photography world, which we're obviously going to kind of dive into a little bit. But is there one moment or image that really kind of changed the way you fundamentally view yourself or life in general through through the lens of photography. Wow, one image, huh? No, oh, it's got to be nine eleven. Hands down. Yeah, any 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 one of the pictures I took, one of the, any one of the pictures I took on nine eleven, that was like the, yeah, that was a career a career starter and a life ender. Let's put it that way. You know. Tell us a little bit more about that because that's obviously a lot a long time ago now, and it almost. Would I be correct in thinking it's kind of a seminal moment in your photography career really kind of kickstarted you from being in the, the journalist paparazzi world into more of the kind of fine art and individual pursuit of photography? I, th I think it was just like, you know, completely life altering moment as well, though. Uh, I kind of, I 
describe it as the the day that my life ended and a new life began for a lot for a lot of us. But from a photography standpoint as well, yeah, I'd never done anything like that. Biggest thing I biggest thing I'll ever do, I think, is the biggest picture I'll ever take, which is kind of depressing in a way that you're never gonna. That's it. That was the pinnacle of your career, right? <laughs> Everything else is down from there. Uh, that would be hands down the biggest picture that I've ever taken, and it just changed. You know, I still had to go. I was still doing the the celebrity photography for many years after that, but it de definitely it's like, oh, life is short, really short, and I can't let myself go down this rabbit hole of not doing what I love as well. And how long had you been in New York at that point? Was it still kind of a new city for you? Yeah, well, I, I know New York pretty well. I, I came here in 94. That was when I first moved there. Well, when I first came here and just, I was come, I'd come here like two or three times a year. I was a big hip hop head. So I living in Reading, I was, I was the guy with the big baggy pants, the hoodie, the, the capilla, you know, the Yankee caps, I'm still, still rocking the Yankee yeah, caps. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was that guy. I was going over like two, three times a year, finding all the bootleg records from my like rock and soul. I DJed as well for years down in, uh, was it JW's in Reading? I used to, I was a resident DJ there and, uh, I come here, I was just buy all, buy all my stuff here. So I was coming back and forth for like a few times a year for like six years before I moved here in, I think it was January of 2000, I moved here, but I moved to LA first in August, lived there for a few months. Then I moved to New York, set up the office, lived in like a tiny little apartment on Ninth Avenue, not far from where I am now actually. And shared that with, shared a one bedroom with uh, my co-worker Dan and we just we never really even saw each other anyway we we're out the door like we were fl flying all the time we never saw each other so but I, yeah I, I know I know it pretty well what made you get up and get out uh during 9-11 or post 9-11 to to take photos and is that something that you think about even to this day like I consciously want to get up get out there to capture this or you know how, how does that evolved over the years I think it's just doing something you love. I I really really enjoy it. Like the the the, the process of taking pictures. I always have, you know, from when I first started doing it. It's very addictive, and I do. You know, I've I've sh I've shot for money as well. You know, obviously, but I've found myself in a position now where I've been doing this long enough, thirty two years now. I don't really have to do any assignments now that I don't want to do. You know, I can't deal with the BS anymore with that world as well. And, it, and also the photography world has changed drastically from when I first started as well. Like there was people used to flaunt their checks in front of your face about how much money they used to make. And I'm, I guarantee you there are not people doing that anymore. Well, they are, but it's just likes and followers instead of money. Yeah. Oh, I've got, yeah, I've got X amount of followers. I must, it's like, it's this social currency of how important you are in life based on how many followers you bought. <laughs> Is it just insane? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I got four I got four thousand likes. I'm obviously better than you. Yeah. yeah. It's a little better little person, sad. let alone better photographer. Yeah. It is it yeah, is a little it's a, sad. Little, it's a little yeah, it's a little sad. Well speaking of good and best, um I mean I've been a fan of yours for a while and um yeah, your your street photography is is definitely you know I I consider I, I'm not a street photographer but I love street photography I've I've tried to do it and failed, um, but I I think from where Please I stand there are, there there are two incredible street photographers in today's day and age you're one of them I love Billy D as well, um, yeah, same yeah, city and style. different styles um, but incredible incredible artwork both of you. Um, so yeah, I just want to want to get that in there, but I know you've been recognized across many platforms, publications, exhibitions, articles, all that kind of stuff. And I re I think you were named as one of the, the most influential photographers, street photographers of today, one of the top 50 or 52 or something. Is that something that that one, that one was a strange one. Like I, you know, um, it came up as 
you know, 52 most influential street street photographers and all, oh, hang on, let's have a look at this. And then sure enough, like I, my name's on there and there's only about four people on the list that were actually living. And I'm like, <laughs> I, I realize that most of these, most of these lists are all just like subjective. It's like, all right, it's something, but the guy did it based on Google data it had nothing to do with his list of his favorites. It was just purely based on who had the most Google data driven around them. So like someone like Eric Kim was listed on that. And he, he says, look, Eric Kim might not necessarily be a defining street photographer, but he has a massive influence and has a huge audience and based on the Google data at the time. So that was one. And then the next one came out. It was like top 10 contemporary street photographers living today. And I'm like, oh, all right, we've gone from 52 to 10. And I keep, I keep hitting these like, you know, top 20 photographers to, to follow in 2024, but it's all, you got to remember, it's just that person's opinion. And there's, you know, it's probably a heavy sway or they get lazy and they look at the other lists and then just copy that list. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, uh, not if there's data behind it, right? So, I mean, define influential. I mean, that, that was a, a good word for them to put in the title. Otherwise, if you said 52 best, I mean, what's best, right? But, you know, it is yeah. subjective, but I do think the excellence stands above all else. So it's, it's quite, I, th I think it would be quite difficult for people to see your photography go, no, that's shit. Right. So, you know, that once, once you get to that, wife, that cream, uh, it does. <laughs> <laughs> oh well you're she in good gets, company she gets a pass she gets a pass <laughs> yeah she does yeah, yeah. I, I always use my wife as a like a litmus test of how how i think a photo would be received in the outside world because you know as us as yep. photographers go, oh, this, this is amazing then you might put it out i mean social media obviously is a great kind of not a great but it's probably the first thing we go to to get validation but actually mine is my wife i show the photo and i can see within a second, if she's going to pretend to like it or she actually likes it. Right. So I don't, I don't know, it kind of helps. Do you, how do you judge yourself? How do you judge your own photography? Probably very harshly, but do you, is that still a, having done it for a few decades and you're, you're almost veteran in kind of the photography world these days, how do you judge yourself? Is that important? Are you very critical of, of yourself? Um, I don't, I don't buy into the hype. It's, <laughs> it's, I don't buy into it. I'm like, shit, I've got to do better. Or I've got to come up with something, switch it up, like make something a little bit more interesting for myself as well. You know, I'm, I'm, you got, you got to stay motivated as well. Right. And in the, in the work that you're doing, you've got to like look at a shot and go, oh, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. I'm, I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying taking this picture or that's a cool effect, you know, just to try to switch it up a bit. Uh, but when it's really just, it's really hard when someone describes you as like legend or goat or someone like that. And you're like, hey, what have you been smoking, mate? <laughs> it's very, it's, it's very surreal. Like it's, it's appreciated. It's like really, you know, um, overwhelming. Let's put it that way. Do you think it's important that we do judge photography? People talk to me all the time about art being subjective and photography being subjective. And I think that's, that's true only up to a certain point, right? You, you know, g going out with an iPhone and just snapping a photo of someone without any thought or intent or kind of concept behind it is technically, yeah, it's a photograph, but is it photography or is it, I, I mean, the, the, it's such a gray area that we always seem to be, you know, in the, this endless pursuit. Well, how do you feel about that today compared to where it was maybe 20 years ago? Well, it's the, the barrier to entry was a lot harder back then. You know, you had, you had to really know what you were doing, right? You couldn't just go out and wing it like today. The, the, the process of learning is a lot, lot faster today. Like when I started, right, you had to shoot film, develop it, print it. You know, you could go to snappy snaps and get your prints done if you wanted to, you know, like a, a bog standard kind of thing or, but you you know, if you got your exposure wrong, that was it. You kind of messed up. Now you've got, you know, 12 stops, dynamic range. You can really screw up really badly and it's still savable. 
anyone can pretty much shoot a picture these days. And you look, you you know, we I was in the summit. It's a a location the other day. I was teaching a teaching someone, and we're watching this girl, and she's doing like a million selfies of herself. You know, and this the poor boy, the poor boyfriend has got to do all these pictures <laughs> as well. And we we were already on the third level, and we realised shit. She hasn't even come up yet. She's still shooting pictures of herself. Because even like that person is like, like, yeah, they're doing it on a phone, but they're really striving to get the best picture that they, she can get of herself. And you see it everywhere. People, you know, I think the general standard of the excellence of photography has come down. But I think the average has gone up, way up. You know, there's a lot more average, high, a very high average now, but. The problem is now a lot of people are just like, either they're not getting seen the really good stuff, or it's just that everyone's copying everybody else because they're chasing the likes and they're not, they're not innovating and bringing something new to the table. I think that's happening a lot. Yeah. And I think it's okay for us to say something is good and something is bad. You know, I think it's in, in, it certainly in the West, it's, um, you, you kind of demonized if you have standards right and even in photography and the art world it's like well something can be good and something can be bad yeah a lot of it's in the eye of the beholder but you know if you actually to break things down quite um structurally then you can identify something's good or bad that's why there are still i don't partake in competitions but there are still competitions and again that's subjective but there's still an, a, a fundamental principle behind all of this so i think it's okay to to kind of have that view yeah it, it's great that it's homogenized more in the in the way that it's yeah. more accessible it, more accessible to people who may not have had access to it before because you know back in the analog days it's it's expensive right it's very expensive today but and it's time consuming yeah so how do you break through that how do you street photography is often synonymous with you know kind of a poetic way of of illustrating you know vis visual elements how do you go about kind of creating that message, creating that poetry? Do you shoot from the hip or some of it kind of researched and set up? And how do you go about your process there? So I, I come at it more from like a press photographer point of view, because that's my background. You know, it's, it's been my background for a long, a long time. So I'm, the way I look at it is like, well, some, you know, there's some things are a portrait, some things are a candid moment. Some things are, I'm waiting for a scene to happen. I want to be able to, I want to be able to adapt. You don't want to become like one of these one note photographers that only knows how to do one thing and they, they might be able to do it well, but that's it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to become, I don't want to become in that, get to that place where you're just bored with your own work. So I'm, I'll go out there, um, I'll assess whether something's going to be a better as a candid moment or it's a portrait but it's like you know i was thinking about this earlier today i don't know what it is but for some reason a lot of people think that a lot of the photography from the past was all candid and i i get it every day i get messages on instagram saying oh did you ask them to pose or do you go up to people a lot of the most famous pictures that you've seen that you thought were candid were not candid moments. You know, a lot of them were set up. Um, there's the one famous picture of the, the two, it's the woman walking down the street, I think it was in Rome, where all the guys are looking at her. I don't know if you know that picture. Mm -hmm. but very famous shot, right? And... You look at it and you go, all right, that's, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a cool candid moment. Only it wasn't a candid moment that was created. And they actually ran through that a couple of times. So she didn't just do, she didn't just do one take. She did a couple of different takes of that. But to the viewer today, they're like, oh, that's a candid moment. But it wasn't. There's lots of great pictures that were set up and it's, it's just, that's the way it was, you know? And it, when I say set up, it could be that it was a portrait of someone, but they look at it and they genuinely think that some photographer is just standing in front of that person and taking a picture and they didn't say anything. Like there's a Vivian Meyer show at the Photogravisca. Um, it's a 
exhibition in New York right now. And a lot of the work, it, you know, it's beautiful portraits on the street, but some people, they think that it's all candid moments. It's not. So I, you want, you need to be a good photographer where you can adapt to a situation. You can say, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to go by the conformities of what some person has deemed as street photography. And I'm just going to take pictures and I'm going to enjoy taking pictures. What does street photography mean to you then? I'd love to find the person who first turned it. I would love to. Yeah, I would just... love to. The, the, the shit that this guy or this woman has caused is just like the endless questions. Um, what would you call no, it? For, no, it's, I'm just photography. It's just photography at the end of the day. It's just, yeah, we, we can't, life can't handle things just being a thing. We have to put everything in boxes because our brains are too small to be able to handle. It's just something, it's a thing. Leave it at that. You know, we don't all have to be in a box. There's is a difference when you're trying to market yourself. Okay. That's the difference because you can't be the master of everything. It doesn't happen. It's like you're the master of nothing. Right. So street photography, people will say, I'm a street photographer because they're marketing themselves in that category. But I'm just a, I'm just a photographer. Always have been. I can't wait to put street photography in your title of this podcast. Street photographer. Yeah. Film yeah. Um, but in that, re in the same respect though, does cohesiveness, I mean, cohesiveness is important. So, you know, does there need to be a, you know, a clear identity to your style, which I think is, I guess, more organic, right? Um, certainly as you get on in the, in the profession, but is black and white then something that you consciously thought would bind your photos together and you know give more of a, a timeless aspect to them or is it just that you naturally were drawn to black and white I'm, I'm more drawn to black and white anyway that's where i started so you know we didn't i didn't have the money for color and printing colors a bloody nightmare so i was more drawn black and white was easier to shoot easier to print in the dark room you could go out shoot in the day process it print it by night nice and easy um so that was where I started and I really, there's something you really enjoy about that. And then you go into like the work world and everything's color. That's not enjoyable. You know, I not that many great memories of that stuff. So when I, when I started going back into like shooting for myself, it was more black and white again, because it was the, it was, that was the mental separation for me between the two was this one's for me, that one's for work. So, you know, there's, there's plenty of pictures that I shoot in color, but I don't necessarily choose to share them. I don't also share the bar mitzvahs that I shoot every now and then, or the pharmaceutical campaigns that I do as well. I don't share that stuff. I, you know, I had to do stuff in the style of like Martin Parr, where it's completely like very poppy flash, where you wouldn't, if you saw the work, you wouldn't even recognize it as me, but that is a photographer you have to be able to shoot everything and anything to a decent level enough good enough for the client but then you have your work as well right the stuff that you really enjoy doing and that's the black and white the moody the timelessness you know that's what i gravitate to the the timeless images creating images that you don't know when they were taken but you're going to remember them and why New York? Does that play into the black and white theme or was it just a, a city you found yourself in a long time ago and fell in love with it? Was it deliberate decision? Love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah. It's very different from Reading. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I, I, tried, I tried to get, you know, I tried to get here once before and it was get, coming, you, you may know, it's like trying to get in here is almost impossible for us like for me to get my first visa it was like i was coming in under a, a journalism visa and i got denied the first two times and i was like well i got denied the first time i was like well i want to come over on holiday oh you can't do that well when can i go well you can't you can never go to america ever again and it was like what and i said no you have to get that visa otherwise you can never go to the states again and this is a city that country that i was just like i this is where i'm gonna live so i had to go through hell to get three attempts, got 
got the journalism visa, came over here, and I was I was working on a I was actually working in real estate as well, like trying to make some extra bucks because I was doing this thing for D, this DJ magazine and didn't really there wasn't enough work to make it livable to be able to be here and this realization kicked in they're like shit this is not going to happen i'm gonna have to go back with my head you know back to england and then i was like you know i found myself living in my parents house in dorchester after trying to make it here and just like this shit you know this this can't be it found myself working as a i went on unemployment for one week and i was like sod this i was like I'd rather earn the money. Like, this is ridiculous. So I, so I became a waiter. I was working in a place called Judge Jeffries in Dorchester. So I was working as a, I was working as a waiter. And then I was like, well, there's got to be, there's got to be more to it than this. I've just studied in Reading doing photography for years. Got a, saw a job came up at Woking, a newspaper called Woking and Times. Went back to, <laughs> I, I moved back to Reading where I kept, where I've been living and I was sharing a house with two housemates. I, I managed to bullshit my way into the job. Um, I was chief photographer, my first photography job. I was chief photographer and I started, I was doing that for a year and then I got offered a job working for an agency outside of Reading called INS. And it was like, you know, I was, it was good. I was living in Reading. I was outside London. I was making, you know, about I don't know, 13 and a half grand a year. Um, had myself a nice Ford Fiesta, you know, life, life was good. And then met some guy in a car and said, well, you actually, my two friends in LA got jobs going. You should probably call them up and then boom away. And then it was like, right, it's back on. And now it's different because. I'm working for an agency. I've got a journalism visa. Um, they said, can you go and set up the New York office for us? They paid for my rent for one year and my utilities for six months, which is huge. It's huge because you've got, you got your broker fee paid for as well, which is like, that's five, six grand right there. And I'm in New York City doing exactly what I want to do. So never give up, man. Even if you if find you, yourself as a wait, even if you're a waiter, it's going to come. It's around the corner, <laughs> you know? Although, yeah, I don't want to put it negative. I mean, not everyone can do it. Not everyone can do it, right? Not everyone can be a photographer. Um, you know, I don't want to be snobby about it at all. And it, it's encouraging and inspirational to know that people can work hard over years and years and get to where they want to get to. But, you know, going back to what we talked about before, I think, I think we sometimes fall into the trap that, you know, anyone can do anything. So, well, yeah, they can, but whether they're going to be good at it is a different kind of, kind of thing. Not everyone gets a medal. Yeah. Not everybody gets a medal. You've got to bloody work hard for it, you know? Yeah. Unfortunately, I think today we kind of also give out medals for just participating um, in the metaphorical exactly. sense of the word. So it, it can kind of blur the lines a little bit. But Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't always work. When you look back at that, those kind of tough times, and I'm sure because you're human like the rest of us, you've had many tough times since. Are any of the have any of those kind of tough times as a kind of established photographer, kind of from that moment that you described onwards to today? Have you had any kind of creative blocks or lack of inspiration, lack of motivation, and if so, how have you managed to kind of grind yourself out of it? Right, every photographer gets it. And it happens all the time. So don't, don't let it get to you because I always realized it was like, right, well, and you could go through a two month period when your pictures are just terrible. Okay. You're not getting anything. And then you'll shoot one week and you'll get three of the best images you've ever taken in your life. And it does just the way it rolls. And the important thing is just to not beat yourself up because it will, it will, it will come back round again. It happened to me so many times when I was doing like news jobs, you'd be wondering like, why you're not, why you're not finding your flow. So yeah, it's happened to me. It's happened to me a lot. Was there, is there anything deliberate that you kind of dig into in terms of a, a mental toolkit to kind of break yourself out of that? Or do you just, are you just patient? You just wait, uh, knowing that it's going to come, it's going to come, it's going to come. 
um, surround myself with like art that influences me. Go go back to things that I know well that I enjoy. So like shooting in the shooting people in the steam or shooting people with umbrellas in the rain. Something I know well and something that I enjoy, and that I will, I'll use it as. Not that I'm going to get necessarily some great image from it, but I'm like, all right, I'm going to exhaust the hell out of this, trying to find my groove again. I'll go to museums, just walk around the museums, like just drink it in, movies, taking in as much as I can, trying to get, believe it or not, one of the ones I used to do, it sounds pretty weird. I used to go in the Nike store in on Fifth Avenue because... Mm -hmm. Whoever ha whoever handles their digital marketing and the store stuff, on point. I'd go in there and I like I'd see some like digital thing on a built on a board. I'm go that would be an awesome idea for something on a website. And I'm gonna take I'm gonna take that creativity. And I'm gonna work on that part of it, and I'm gonna work spruce up my website whilst the other thing is coming. So I'm always always trying to do something creative, whether it's that or like font design you know it doesn't it's not always necessarily photography but it all kind of clicks together design is a big element of photography isn't it especially in the digital world we live in today and look at your website and it's so wonderfully created and designed um and i'm the same like i keep play fonts especially I keep playing with fonts i don't like that even if it's just like subtitles on a podcast reel or something like, i need to change that change that but i think that's it's kind of good, you know, it's kind of good to have. Oh, have drive me nuts. Person. Yeah, yeah. It does, it really does. Font, font design is, font design is way worse. <laughs> way worse than photography. I, I work with, I work with a designer called uh, The Letterist. Um, she did the, the book for me and she's done a lot of stuff for me. Really, really top notch. Like she designed my signature and everything. So we'll be like, we'll go back and forth on like font design and then I'll try to, you know what it's like trying to implement a certain font on a website and then it doesn't exist. And you're like, shit, but everything's got to be cohesive. Yeah. You can lose your mind with that stuff. And you even bring that over into the, the kind of the dilution of Instagram posts, right? You bring that design over into your beautiful carousels and your beautiful posts, which I think is extremely important. How time consuming is that? <laughs> yeah it's not, it's not an everyday if, post if, if people knew if people yeah. really knew the amount of, when they're just flicking through and they're like that guy spent an hour on that this morning you know it's um now I'll, I'll come up with like templates that i can just work with but there's like a lot of thought that went into maybe creating a template how the algorithm works how you know keeping what pictures people react to I, I, you know, I know that pictures that I, I like might not resonate on social media, so I can't put them in or I have to bury them in a carousel. And it, you'll, you'll say like, all right, well, which one resonates with you the most? And it will be the one that you really like. And it will be buried like number five in a carousel, right? So the people that, people that take the time to flick through the carousel, they're actually invested in your photography. They'll, they're willing to take the time to look and they'll say, that's the one. But then when you post it as an individual shot on its own, it'll get no reaction. So it's very, it's very interesting. You, you see what it's like when people are scrolling with their fingers and they're like speed scrolling and you're like, how are you seeing anything? The doom scroll. Oh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable to watch it. Um, I don't think they're even looking at the screen. That's the thing. Well, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a dopamine chase, isn't it? It's something that almost now is is plugged in. And I say they, you know, I'm culpable of it as well. I I, I have um, protocols around my daily routine that prevent, hopefully prevent that kind of stuff. But I think photography is a little bit different when it comes to social media, right? We're looking for photos. We're looking for inspiration. Sometimes it goes the other way when people get competitive. Go, oh, why is his photo better than mine? Why can he do better photography than me? But that's just life and, and art. But I think, yeah, you know, see people, kind of the general public who may not be interested in visual arts, just sc literally scrolling their life away and, you know, damaging their brain almost irreparably. But that's a separate conversation for a separate day, I think. 
I, th- I think photo- I think photographers by nature are just ultra competitive. Like I know when I was working in the press world, it was horrendous. Like one of my friends, I won't name, um, I'll just say he won a big award. Okay. And it was just like the, the rest of us like would just thank, you know, thank God he finally won it because now he'll shut up because he was out of his system. Right. He'd achieved what he, he wanted to achieve when I was doing the, and then he was a lot easier to work with after that because he did it. But a lot of people, um, like in our world, it was like, right, well, who's making the most money a month and who's getting the most bylines or who's getting the most placements? Who's getting the biggest paparazzi pictures? That was like the the, the scorecard of where you, and there's always someone else that's younger who's going to come along. Maybe they got better informants that's going to knock you off your perch. And then once that's beaten out of you, you kind of don't get it again. Because you realize it's very easy. It's very easy. And I I'm, I find it very awkward when you're around these people and it's just like me, 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 me. Like you you hear them. Like, do you even hear yourself talking? It's like you, you're spitting out your resume at me. And it's obviously that they're not confident in themselves or why they do this. Yeah, they're projecting. Yeah, they're just, they're projecting. And it's like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of past, I'm way past that now. I think as you get older, you... And also because you, you've reached, like, I've, I've already reached way beyond anything I ever thought of. So everything's bonus, you know? Uh, would I have ever thought that I would have, like, have done two books or done all the shows or that I can go around the world and do photography? Hell no. I was, I was, I was a waiter in a Judge Jeffries in Dorchester, you know? And that was where I thought it was going to end. And... Obviously not. So what's around the corner? Exactly. What a wonderful story and um, certainly inspiring for many. Let's talk, talk about the books a little bit. I, I was a day late. Actually, no, Amazon were a day late. By the time I'd left town, Phoenix in the US, they had would late delivery and then they delivered the. So I didn't get a copy of your book, unfortunately. I will do. It's a bit difficult to, to get it over here in Bali, but. Um, tell us a little bit as kind of a, the second book you've come out is relatively new uh, this year, isn't it? Tell us a little bit about the book, what's in it, the process and kind of how you're, how you're thinking about the, the book these days. Uh, so it became, I really enjoyed, I first off first book, I knew that I needed to do a book because it's, it's marketing, right? It's getting your name out there to the world. You, you never know how it's going to play out. It's a heavy investment, really heavy investment. You could, you know, you could drop 40 to a hundred grand easily on producing a book that you are not going to get back. Okay. You're not going to make that money back. That's your first book. So it it better be a hit. So I I did the first book. It way exceeded whatever I imagined. And it meant that getting the second book with Tenoyist was a lot easier to do because I had, you have history. You can say, right, I can come in and I can guarantee I'm going to sell you, I'm going to sell 2,500 copies of your, of this book. I can guarantee you that, you know, that's based on historical figures of the last one, which was at a 5,000 social media following to versus like quarter of a million now, right? They look at, these are statistics that they look at. So the second book came along, I pitched it to Tenorius, who are a big publisher. Um, they've done a lot of the favorites, my favorite photographers like Elliot Erwitt, Thomas Hopker, you know, Rankin, Robert Maplethorpe, all these guys did books with these guys. So I pitched it to them. They said, yep, we'd love to do a book. I didn't expect them to even email me back. So you're just thinking, well, shit, I've actually got to come up with a book now. So it was fortuitous in a good and bad way that we'd just gone through COVID and I documented about 20,000 images edited from those COVID years in New York under the lockdown. So I knew that I just needed to shoot everything and anything and document it, not knowing that I was going to necessarily do a book with it, but I wanted to get in for historical purposes. So we started producing the book with uh, Anya, 
the letterist. Uh, Lou Proud is the gallery director in New in uh, London for Leica. She curated it. We launched it in Europe first. It came out in Germany in May of twenty three. Yeah, May of twenty three, and then it came out in August over here in the states. And to date, we sold just under five thousand copies in less than a year. So it was a huge success from a book point of view. Uh, I really enjoyed doing the book on this one. Like the first book didn't have as much control. Second one, it, you know, and also the first book, I kind of wanted to tell the story about, you know, my days of doing paparazzi. And I, I wanted to get those stories down there just for myself. I figured if I'm going to refinance my house, I might as well get the, uh, the stories in the book as well. Second book uh, had a lot more control on how we put it together. I'm really, really happy with how it came out. The, I think the, the level of photography definitely went up as well. I've improved as a photographer, I think. Uh, and I hope people have been, been enjoying the book. But go out and, go out and get it while you can. I will. Yeah. Next time I'm over in the US, I will, I will I'll definitely, you know, I'll grab a coffee, coffee, I'll grab a coffee as well, but I'll tr grab a copy of the book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you measure your own improvement then? You, you talked about, I think your first book was 2019 just before COVID. And then, so you've had five yeah. years between both books. Having said that you've recognized your photography has got better. How do you, what do you mean exactly? How do you kind of recognize that improvement in your own work? Just a little bit. It's a lot grittier as well. The work, I, like moving helped as well, believe it or not. Like we I passed the, the passport control on 14th Street in New York, moved further uptown. Where I, where I live is a little bit grittier. I think that plays well to the camera as well. Like it's, everything's not so perfect. And as you get older, you start seeing life in different ways. You start depicting things differently. I'm sure in five years' time, if you were to interview me again, I would say, now the work was terrible, and I'm much better now. <laughs> yeah. But isn't that the you beauty? Know, of... it's, it's one of the... Yeah. You know? And it might be that your best picture you ever took was 20 years ago. You know? So, but it's it's definitely better. I'm, I, I'm like I said, I'm my worst critic. I, um, I keep trying to push myself forward. Just for myself, not for anyone else, just for myself. Is that important as artists that we are never like a hundred percent happy? Maybe in a fleeting moment or when we've produced a photo, right, great. I'm I'm absolutely proud and happy of that. Move on. How can I make it better the next time? You know, the best photo is always the next one. Is that important or do you feel like being so critical of ourselves is is almost negative in a way and we can never kind of be in the moment and be happy with kind of what's what we've done up to this point oh it's it's horrible <laughs> I, I think it's i think though if you look at it with a lot of su very successful business people as well it's like this common trait that they never enjoy any of it there's because you i know that i have it where you all right I've, I've done this what's next how much higher can it get because you because you've been doing that your whole life. You've been like, right, this is, you know, I used to write down at the back of a notepad, right, goals for 20, 2005. And then you look at the back, at the end of the year, you go in the notepad, right, how many of those goals did I achieve? And then you say, right, well, what's the next goal? And you, you look at people like, uh, you know, Musk, Zuckerberg, all these people, they're the same way. I don't think you, they're never really in the moment and they're never enjoying it. It's but that's why they are as successful as they are. I hope that I enjoy it. I, I enjoy the process of taking them. That I do. But the you know, I have lofty, lofty goals. And you, when you achieve them, it, the goal gets bigger. So, you know, the next the last goal post was US Library of Congress, which I achieved which was a lofty one. And then the next one was, um, I wanted to have something in Paris photo. So I don't know okay. if you know that one. 
that is like the big, it's the big photo show. Everyone, everybody's in Paris for the photo week in November. And that to me is like pinnacle. Everyone in photography is in Paris that week. And I just got uh, offered a solo show outside in like one of the richest areas of Paris. So that I have like 32 prints up on the streets. Wow. Like, done. Done. Fantastic. Um, so now it's like when, and that only, that came about like two weeks ago. So that's not announced or anything yet. Um, so it's like the next goal will be solo show within the next 20 years in the Met Metropolitan Museum in New York. That would be the next goal. No Fantastic. small feat, that one. <laughs> How do you, I mean, you do a lot of exhibitions, right? You do a lot of photo shows. How, why? It's a great way that people can actually see print. You know, it's, it's so much better in print than it is on a phone. You know, you get, and I'm lucky enough now that you, you I, I'm in a position where people come to you. You're not pitching for anything. You know, they're, they're coming to you and they're pitching like, right, well, this morning was some group in Argentina. Hey, we do exhibitions in Argentina. We'd love to have you as part of the show. Do you want to be in it? And then it's like, well, you know, I can't afford like a lot of photographers do this where they enter competitions, they have to print the thing, frame it, ship it to the, to the show, which could be some scam where it's like an exhibition in an office building where they've charged everyone else a hundred dollars to enter or 50 bucks or whatever it is. Right. And it's a scam and you're, I can't afford to be doing that. I don't want any part of that. I don't really agree with it either, but I do get these ones where people will say like, you know, we'll do, do you want to do a solo show in Harrods? We will pay for all the prints. We will put it all together. Definitely count me in. You know, those are the ones that I, I want to do. Uh, but again, it's not, it took 32 years to get to that position where you can do that. Yeah. And uh, interesting, you said you don't, you don't have to pitch anymore. There's, there's almost like this uncanny valley where you work so hard to kind of pitch to others to get jobs, to get money, to get a bigger audience. And then at some point it switches, right? You've got enough audience, you've had enough jobs, you've got enough recognition. Your work is amazing because you've been evolving all this time anyway. And now it, it's kind of flip reverse where you just have people coming to you all the time. And you mentioned when you're talking about your book about how, you know, you had the efficacy of social media behind essentially your pitch to do the book which is great to hear because i'm the one of the, i'm one of the first ones to just lambast social media for for many reasons but if you use it correctly and you put in the time and use it as a tool it it can open up so many doors can't it and can pro provide this kind of evidence to a huge publisher to you know, to guarantee a level of sales or a level of exposure, right? So is, has that been always a kind of conscious? Do you talk about that with, I mean, does it ever enter the conversation with your students? You know, I know we'll talk about your workshops and teaching in a minute, but are you purely, when you're teaching, is it purely kind of technical stuff and narratives and storytelling, or do you kind of encompass business and encompass social media and how to get exposure out there? You you got to you got to do both. You you got I I work with a lot of I've worked with a couple of thousand people at this point. I think there's 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 people that need technical. Okay, so the first question is you always ask people right Do you want to do this as a career or do you want to, or are you just doing this for relief from work? That's the first question, and then you go from there. Because if it's if it's um, relief from work. You don't even need to touch on the social media stuff or any of the marketing or any of that. But if you're someone that's coming and saying, look, I want to be where you are, then you say, okay, well, your photography, we need to improve this, but we need 50% of the time needs to be dedicated to doing this. You've got to work on your social media, your website, your online presence. It's, it's huge. What the, what it will bring to you. So like we're saying earlier, it's like this bloody social score of how many followers you have companies look at that you know i remember i was with i was with a, a particular group and they turned around and said wow you're seeing a huge rise in your instagram right now 
And I, I was going through this period where I added like 60,000 new followers in like six months. And I said, well, how are you seeing that? What, you're monitoring my account? And I said, yeah, actually we are. And they deep dive into your engagement, like the types of engagement. They have all this information to hand. So you're looking at, if that's what that one brand is doing, it means all the other brands are doing the same thing. Okay, so I had one where Porsche came to me and they said, we want, we want, it was through a uh, connect at Leica and he put the, put everything together. And so we want to do a video featuring you uh, with one of the Porsches, but that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the connect at Leica and the fact that you've got quarter of a million followers that is kind of like their demographic. You know, so it's whether you hate it or not, like I just use it as a tool. I don't post pictures of my food, not interested in any of that. I'm not interested in any of the politics, the religion, the comments. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in it's a tool to get my work out there to the world. I'm very appreciative of everyone that takes the time to comment on the pictures, you know, because I realize that's something. And you, you've managed to meet all these people. Like we wouldn't have connected necessarily, right? There's all these people that I've able connected to with all around the world that I talk with back and forth. Um, the amount of students that have written to, written to me through social media saying, hey, I'm doing my final year project. Would you, on a photographer, I want it to be on you. Would you be willing to do something for my final year project? Yes. Um, I always do the test, send me an email. And if someone can be bothered to send you an email, then they're actually invested. Like they will take the time to actually do it. Those are the ones I will, I will back up because if you can't be bothered to send an email, then you were never really, you, I could be one of 20 DMS that someone's done. So I wouldn't have met half of these people. So no, it's whether you love it or hate it, it's, you know, it's done wonders for me and my business. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it, we're, we're too quick to kind of, again, it depends on how people use it, but um, we're too quick to judge and uh, me, me, me included. Speaking of judgment, I want to rewind. And it's something I forgot to ask when you were talking about your early days as paparazzi. Did you get a lot of judgment from, you know, I remember paparazzi. I don't even know if they still exist, but, you know, the, the photographers that were chase celebrities around get in their face and basically piss them off did you tell us a little bit about your your experiences that because i'm just interested um did you get you're a lot hated. of haters did, yeah you're hated yeah so you you're, you're, you're in a little hate, group it's think of it like this you are you're hated by the public you're hated by the security you're hated by the celebrities right you're pretty much hated by everybody it's the most hypocritical thing i've ever been involved in because all the public are the ones that buy it it wouldn't exist if you didn't buy it because it's only by demand all right the security guys they have a valid point they don't really want to deal with us they've got more important things to worry about than us they've got stalkers all the rest of it the celebrities themselves though they need it and a lot of them work with photographers so most of the work that you would see was actually set up and a lot of the celebrities, a lot of the celebrities involved actually get direct payment from the photographers. So it would be like control. It, you'd look at an image and it would be like, well, say there's a new product, a new type of water has come out and you see that picture of a celebrity walking down the street, holding that bottle of water. It's because that company has paid that, cele paid that celebrity to carry that bottle and be photographed by this particular photographer to make it look like paparazzi. So once you, in the beginning, you, you, it does like your morals, you're like questioning yourself and then you start realizing how the game is played and you're like, hang on a second, they're all bloody in on it. And it's like, it's a big joke. And it's like, you know, we'd have the public complaining sometimes, you're like, you don't get it. She's the one that told me. Yeah, like I'm only here. I'm only here because she called me up. Um, I, w I remember once we were waiting for Sarah Jessica Parker coming out of a, a hospital. She was uh, she'd had a kid, and we were on day rate for the New York Post to get this picture. And this old woman comes up to me, 
And it was like, why won't you just leave her alone? And I said, because you won't bloody let me. And she had the New York Post underneath her, underneath her arm. And I'm like, you're paying for me to be here. And she, she, she was like, oh, okay, I get it. What did you learn from that experience that you, you, you know, in a photography sense or a human connection sense, what did you learn that you kind of took into your own photography? Tons. It's some of the best photographers out there, hands down. Incredible. Um, you have to be so good and like some of the most driven business people, because it's like, there is no paycheck. You go out in the morning, you don't get paid. If you don't get home, if you don't come home with something, you'd have guys working 24 seven, like nonstop. I, I tell them, look, at least take the weekend off. Otherwise you're going to burn out within a year. You'll be, you're going to be done. They, they're driven. They hustle like no tomorrow, you know, it's like, right. I have one of my uh, friends, hardest, hardest working photographer I've ever met in my life. A guy called Dennis Van Tyne. He used to shoot 12 events a day, premieres, red carpets, you name it. He would be syndicating his images through like seven or eight different agencies. It got, unfortunately it got the better of him in the end. Um, but you imagine that going out and shooting 12 different events a day. Like every day, this guy was doing this and he was, he wasn't like the official guy, like the wire image at the time was like the big agency that would cover all the press event all the big, he wasn't like the official guy, but he would be the guy that everyone would buy because he was so bloody good. And um, you look at photographers like that and you're like, fuck, you know, I wish, and he could go, he could switch it on. Like he could be doing like a really creative shot and get like a double page in Newsweek and then flip the switch to like a, a red carpet event. And it was just like adaptable. Like if you're doing 12 different things a day, you can adapt to anything. So they were some of the best photographers, but then, you know, you'd get like the, the shit that would come in as well. Like they weren't all great photographers. Let's get that. Um, but a lot of them were really, we call them like operators. That's like some, the stuff that I used to do was like, you were called an operator. It wasn't that you were just a photographer. You were also a journalist. Like you could fly me, you could say to me, right, I need you to go find this person, you know? And I, my job was to go out and find them and do whatever it took, background checks, all of this stuff. Remember the, the funniest one I ever got was, uh, this lawyer came out and said that he would re represent Osama bin Laden if he would to go to court. And he was on CNN. My friend Paul, uh, the journalist, sent me this, showed me that he showed me this picture and said, "Look, if you just happen to see him walking around on the streets of New York, right?" And it's just like my job is just trawling around the streets. I call up two hours later, yeah, got him. What do you mean you got him? Who said that lawyer? How did you get him? And I said, saw him sat outside a restaurant and went up to him and said, if he wouldn't mind posing for a headshot, done. And it was just like, that was the job. Or it was, uh, you know, flying down to Brazil to find track down some guy. Or, you know, I remember we were doing a, a, a couple related to a pedophile priest. And we tried four cities. We've flown to four different cities in America. And then finally we found out it was pretty shady, but it was the story <laughs> itself. It was the story itself. We found we found out like a relative had died. We called up the the flower company, and we just said, "Look, there was a there was some discrepancy with the invoice." And we said, "Look, do we have do you have the address for the new?" And it was like a rental, and we showed up. And nobody, you know, their name wasn't even on this thing. It was only because it was through this flower company. And we showed up and the person just looked at me and was like, I'm really, really impressed how you found me. <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> like, they didn't say anything else. It's like, wow. So, yeah, you just, I learned, I learned so much during that job and it's applied to everything I've done going forward. So even I hated it at the time, I owe it, I owe that job a lot to my current status. What specifically do you apply to going out into the streets of New York and shooting 
people, places, scenes, atmosphere that you that you've garnered from that experience? Being able to think, think, think things through quickly, like. You know, you're not, you're never reacting to things. You're always predicting things. You're, you're trying to predict how things are going to play out. Even on the street, you're looking at like people that are coming a hundred feet away from you and then positioning yourself before they've even got anywhere near you. You're already thinking about the shot. Um, these are things that you would do as a, when you're doing celebrity photography, like, well, which, if the security is walking on this side, which side do I need to be on to get the picture? You know, same kind of thing. Like, all right, what, what background do I want to use for this particular candid shot when that person's walking towards me? How do I want to set this up? You know, um, things like that, like planning out my day, like, all right, I'm going out in a snowstorm. Where's the first area that I want to hit? You know, if I'm going out at 3 a.m., where do I want to hit at this time? And then building my uh, route around that as well. So everything's kind of planned out to the hour. Like how can I get the most out of today? So I'm not just walking around freely. Everything's very full through. That's a common misconception, isn't it? With, I'm going to put this in inverted commas, street photography is people think I oh, just shoot from the hip you know, all the time, but you still got to know where the, 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 the good times are, the good light, the good conditions, the good atmosphere. And like you said, even in the moment, you're thinking three, four steps ahead, or you're predicting people coming this way, or how it's going to hit the light. So you're kind of visualizing it. Is that a lot of that, I guess, is through just practice and repetition? Yeah, it's, it's like anything you have to practice. I, I personally, like I can shoot from the hip. I can do all of that, but it would get really, really boring. If that was all I was doing, I would just lose my bloody mind after like six months. There are, there are occasions where like, I look at something and go, right, that guy would be an amazing portrait. So I'm going to go up to him and I'm going to ask, and I'll put, I'm going to put my 75 on and I'm going to do a nice portrait. And then there's some situations where I'm going to say, right, that's a good shot from the hip. Right, I want it. I'm going to do it because I don't, there's too much in the background. I'm going to stick my lens at 1.4. I'm going to put it at four feet and I'm going to, I'm going to hit them right as they're four feet away from me. You know, so there's none of this like, right, I'm going to bung it on F8 and do zone focusing. It's everything and just shoot everything like that. You know, that would get incredibly dull and boring. So everything for me is like every setting is different. You know, do I want to add motion blur to this? Do I want to show the hustle and bustle of the street by doing a pan shot of people walking across 42nd Street, tracking them so there's all the movement, but I catch one person sharp with the briefcase all these kind of things that that's what i'm thinking about yeah i love it i talk about this all the time in terms of intent and mindful kind of photography just being mindful of what you what you what you're trying to do or what you're receiving from your external environment right how can i oh i'm i might be getting this back to my lens in which case how can i kind of canvas that the best with maybe technical settings or or whatever it might be. So it's it's good to hear. And I think that does separate the best from the rest, I guess. It certainly does with you. I'm sure of it. Well I think a lot of people listen to too much. There's too many videos out there from experts. Mm. There's a hell there's a hell of a lot of experts out there. Well e experts. <laughs> yeah, there's a hell of a lot of experts. And it's like, you know, the the magical settings. You know, or if you leave your camera on auto all the time you, and you get a great picture, but you don't know how you got it because the camera was on auto, you know, little, little things like that. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know what to say, really. <laughs> just stop, stop listening. Stop, just go out, stop listening to all the magical settings and the, the, the experts like myself. You've also got to find what works for you and you've got to find your own style and you can only do that if you, you know learn the basics and go and figure out the rest right um yeah, yeah you've got to stand a, out yeah yeah, yeah i mean it's, it's, and, it's no, and that's more difficult i would argue today than it than it ever has because as we touched upon at the beginning of this conversation there's so many of us right guys millions and it's like all right how do you stand out in a pool of millions and when 
and also people put so much pressure on themselves like i've got to make it i've got to you know or i'm gonna i'm gonna quit my life and become a street photographer i'm gonna be a millionaire it didn't work like that for me you know it's long long journey to get to a certain point and then there was also that grace period of like right i need a i need a proper job where i've got health care i've got an income and i can go and enjoy my i can go and enjoy doing this because you feel so much you you're more free because there's not the pressure of shooting for a client so the stuff that you are shooting is stuff that you truly love and enjoy doing because you're only doing it for you and if you're going out and you're shooting pictures because you're like i want this picture to be in the style of billy d you know Billy's a great photographer and Billy has his look. But if you're going out and you're going, right, I want to I want to do a picture exactly like Billy, then you're not doing yourself any justice by doing that. Like you've got to go out and create something for yourself because otherwise you're just going to be a clone of something else that already exists. You know, how are you going to stand out? And how, if I was to throw that question back at you, how do you, you know, if you were to try and pinpoint one kind of secret ingredient that, made your work so attractive and made people follow you and love what you do try and pinpoint that one secret ingredient for me that's tough because it's not technical the, the thing is the thing is the, the photography the photography is the person right that's what it is when someone takes a picture that's them showing themselves to the world it's like one of the you're putting yourself out there and people read into it what they will. So, you know, that's me putting myself out there, you know, who I am. And, you know, you're going to, you people are going to take their own slant on the, the way that they see your work. And some people might not like it at all. So just go, yeah, you got to be you as well. Yeah, be true to yourself. And, and actually more than that, kind of know yourself. And if you're getting distracted with, like you talked about earlier, your inspirations or, or watching a silly little video from a so-called expert, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. It's so easy. It's certainly in photography with, uh, and today's cameras, right? We've got a million settings and I don't even know what page that's on at this and what should I shoot at? And often the first question from an audience member is what camera settings was it? Or what camera was it? Or what lens to use? That's the wrong question. Like get to know yourself, get to know you know, how you shoot. And yeah, I think. That's a lovely way of kind of ending this conversation. At least be be true to yourself. And if that's uh, that's probably got to be one of the most not secret, but one of the most important ingredients any of us can have as photographers. Definitely. Thank you, Phil. Um, what do we what do we look out for in the future now? How do you evolve over the next five years? Over the next ten years? Is that something that you you, you think about every day? Yeah, I'm I'm taking like a I've taken like a two month block off because I go pretty intense. It's it's all in, and it's like right. I needed a I needed a two month block where I just like backed off, take care of stuff at home, still shoot, but the mental thing of like right, what what's next? Uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be another book, I think. That's what I'm I'm gonna have to do. I'm gonna have to do another book, but it won't be New York next time. It'll be I think it's gonna have to be a mixture of overseas. So all, all all the work from overseas from all the different cities that I've had the luxury of visiting. So that that would be a that would be a cool thing. And then uh I'm just carry on, really. Just carry on enjoying it. Never know what's around the corner. I love it. And until Last week, I didn't know this was around the corner. So I've certainly enjoyed it. Thank you so much for taking the time. I'll let you go and have your dinner or whatever you do. Watch the Netflix Thank you, show. sir. <laughs> good to see you. Uh, good to see you, Winchester, lad. Close, yeah. close to where? Yeah. <laughs> Neither of us in the country we were born in, but maybe that speaks exactly. something for the for the country itself. But thanks again, Phil. I hope to, uh, to meet you one day when I'm next in New York. And until then, take good care of yourself. Definitely, mate. Stay well, okay?